Greetings, uh, this is iVideo. My name is John Savers, I'm your host, uh, and today uh, we'll continue our uh, series on World War II. Uh, iVideo, for the uh, initial uh, viewer, is a program which attempts to um, uh, discover uh, information uh, in history, um, not uh, normally or usually uh, um, propagandized, uh, uh, brought to the attention of people, uh, found in the educational system, uh, and to uh, present it for additional consideration. Uh, our video does look at history in a kind of a broad context, that is we may look at uh, uh, martial uh, uh, events, uh, wars, we may look at art, uh, entertainment, uh, economics, uh, we may look at uh, uh, astrology, uh, we may look at astronomy, we may look at um, uh, re archaeology, uh, and so forth, um, biology even. But uh, at any rate, uh, we do try to uh, bring to your attention uh, information uh, that uh, is just not usually um, uh, uh, brought to, uh, to the fore in the educational system. Uh, we think that this causes a, a problem uh, in the educational system. We think that uh, students are not getting um, a, uh, a broad and rounded uh, education because of these omissions. So we try uh, to have a little educational um, program here uh, in that sense of, um, of uh, filling in the gaps uh, or bringing to the attention of uh, others uh, uh, these matters which should be considered, I believe. Um, you're free to, uh, to disagree. Uh, we are, are certainly uh, people who are firm freedom of speech uh, and thought uh, which uh, uh, initiates such speech. Um, we will, um, uh, in this particular episode, initiate a, a sort of an attempt to understand what might be the motivation behind the alleged atrocities uh, relating to the camps uh, in World War II uh, and uh, hope to, uh, to expand uh, understanding and knowledge uh, uh, in that regard. Now, uh, in, for this particular reason, uh, and I do want to have you be patient because it may seem like something of a digression, the, the uh, initial part of this uh, program um, uh, being uh, relatively seemingly removed from the, um, uh, the subject matter. But uh, uh, bear with me and uh, we will begin by taking a look uh, at um, uh, the uh, ramifications of a comment made by um, George Orwell, which I thought was rather insightful. That is that those who control the present control the past. And those who control the past control the future. Well, uh, let's take a look at that and just see how that may be playing in contemporary America. So please consider. Every child who enters school at age five is mentally ill because he comes to school with allegiance toward our elected officials, our founding fathers, our institutions, and the preservation of this form of government, patriotism, nationalism, sovereignty that proves the children are sick. Because the truly well individual is one who has rejected all of those things and is what I would call the true international child of the future. This is a citation from the Illuminati by Eric Z. Levitt, footnote page 61, citing Dr. Pierce, Harvard University, addressing 2,000 teachers in Denver, Colorado in 1973. Well, gee whiz, uh, I think that Dr. Pierce would be uh, really annoyed by uh, a personality such as mine, uh, my sort of views and whatnot, um, uh, a rather backward person from their point of view, uh, such people. But let's consider another citation uh, just uh, to kind of get in your mind how broad uh, this is in the educational system. Any child who believes in God is mentally ill. Now this is a citation from the Illuminati, Eric Z. Levitt, 
footnote, page 61, uh, citing Dr. Paul Brandwine, consultant for the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, Title III, 1970. Well, I think with such consultants, uh, and bearing in mind the Masonic uh, influence uh, in the Supreme Court and elsewhere in our judiciary, uh, it's, it's pretty understandable uh, how we have gotten in this kind of educational mess. Uh, of course, uh, Freemasonry is uh, uh, rather influential, as we have seen uh, in um, uh, the U.S. Congress. Uh, we, uh, in the past, have given a citation, uh, which we may have um, a reason to bring again uh, in another program at another time. But at which, at which time uh, we had the subject of masonry uh, crop up in the Senate floor, uh, and we had such people as um, uh, Alan Simpson, a uh, uh, yeah, 33rd degree um, Freemason, I think, from Wyoming. Um, uh, Jesse Helms, I think a 32 or 33 degree uh, Mason from Carolina, North Carolina. Strom Thurman, a 32, 33 degree uh, Freemason from um, uh, South Carolina. And uh, uh, Senator Byrd of West Virginia, 33rd degree Freemason. So they were all standing up and uh, saying, well, uh, in the words of Mr. Allen uh, Simpson, uh, I believe that uh, Freemasonry is just the bedrock of this country. And I thought to myself, well, if Freemasonry is the bedrock of this country, uh, who needs quicksand, you know? Uh, it's like the House of Usher sinking into the swamp right now. And uh, so, but um, uh, these people do have a high opinion of themselves. They're there in uh, great numbers of influence and um, uh, this is why we've had these uh, dreadful changes in the last uh, 40, 50 years. But uh, let's take another citation, shall we? Our aim is nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands to dominate the political system of each country and the world economy as a whole. Freedom and choice will be controlled within very narrow alternates. Now this is a citation from the Satori uh, A. H. Quig. Um, this is from the inside page, and it cites uh, Dr. Carol Quigley, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, uh, 1996. Um, now to elaborate a little bit on uh, Dr. Carol Quigley, he was a professor uh, in the uh, Foreign Service Department at Georgetown University. Um, uh, and uh, he um, was referred to uh, in the initial inauguration uh, speech by President Clinton, uh, alluding to him and thereby also signaling to the, um, uh, the world, which is knowledgeable, uh, where he was coming from, what to expect from him, and so forth. Um, I'm one of you, in other words. So um, uh, with that, uh, we will uh, continue a little bit now to take a peek at things, uh, another citation, if you will. I should like to address myself to the problem of political change. I think we accept the idea of vast expansion in social regulation. It may take such forms as legislation for the number of children, perhaps even legislation determining the sex of children once we have a chance, uh, the regulation of weather, the regulation of leisure, and so on and so forth. Now this is a citation from the Satori and the New Mandarins, A.H. Uh, a. H. Krieg, uh, page 205, uh, citing the big new Brzezinski. Well now, I, I will just mention in passing that if they contemplate um, uh, taking control of the issue of the number of children and the kind of children, um, they also are in perfect position to produce their new man through uh, blending processes. These people probably go down to their lodges at night uh, and say, uh, being uh, snake people of course, we just like God, just like God. Uh, we bring up the mighty, we bring down the low, we um, we uh, gonna get people so confused that God himself could not uh, uh, straighten it all out because uh, we just like God. 
Well, uh, maybe, but uh, I have my doubts. Anyhow, um, they thank themselves quite mighty and, uh, and whatnot. But uh, let's consider another citation. Harry James Cargus has written a Christian response to the Holocaust, and not surprisingly, it has a forward by Elie Wiesel, who calls Cargus a fervent and faithful Christian. Cargus refers to himself as a post-Auschwitz Catholic. He claims the Holocaust was a culmination, in great part, of Christian teachings about Jews, a misinterpreted and erroneous theology. He informs us, Jewish survivor Eli Wiesel told me in a television interview that he believes that the sincere Christian knows that what died in Auschwitz was not the Jewish people, but Christianity. Uh, this is a citation from the Spectre of Power, uh, pages 9091 by Malcolm Ross. Further your understanding of this particular area, please consider. American-born rabbi Shlomo Riskin, who lives on Israel's West Bank, from which Palestinians who have lived there for a thousand years have been deported, said in an inspirational sermon, the world is divided into two parts, those who actively participated with the Nazis and those who collaborated with them. It was Christianity, especially Catholic Christianity, that fostered the Holocaust. The church is still dripping with blood because it still has not recognized Israel. This is a citation from the Barnes Review, volume four, number two, March, April, 1998, page 67, citing an article by uh, Mr. W.A. Carto. What are the implications, you may ask? Please consider. A Christian theologians such as Franklin H. Littell, who in his book, The Crucifixion of the Jews, regards the Holocaust as the true crucifixion and the re-establishment of the Jewish state as the resurrection. This is a citation from the Barnes Review, volume five, number five, September, October, 1999, page three, in an editorial. A comment by Mr. Littell um, uh, seems characteristic of um, what I term bogus Christians um, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, what might be called the ignorante Christian uh, who may go along with such things uh, out of a lack of perception. Well, what is the inference of all this? Um, Thus, the whole people, Israel, the Jews misnamed, in the form of the elected of the nation, gradually became the Messiah of the world, the Redeemer of mankind. This is a citation from God's Covenant People, page 239, citing Joseph Klossner, Ph.D., The Messianic Idea in Israel, uh, page 163, uh, published 1956. Also, God is absorbed in the nationalism of Israel, the Jews misnamed. He, the Jew, becomes the national ethos, that is, God or guiding belief. This is a citation from God's Covenant People, page 238, citing Rabbi Solomon Goldman in God and Israel, quoted by Douglas Reed in The Controversy of Zion, uh, 1978, page 48. A further, fundamentally, Judaism is anti-Christian. This is a citation from God's Covenant People, a chapter 8, page 189, citing the London Jewish World, 1923. The Israelite Christian, um, uh, this position uh, seems to be stating uh, the uh, Jewish people collectively as the Messiah and therefore is an anti-Christ uh, position. But to, um, uh, this uh, is a position favored, uh, astonishingly, uh, in uh, rather large sections of Christianity, 
are supposed, supposedly Christian uh, uh, thinking uh, areas. But at any rate, um, to further and deepen the understanding of this particular matter, consider this citation. Every Jew somewhere in his being should set apart a zone of hate, healthy, virile hate, for what the German personifies and for what persists in the German. Now, this is a citation from God's Covenant People, chapter 6, page 140, citing Elie Wiesel, 1968, Legends of Our Time, uh, page 142. Uh, it might be noted this is the same Elie Wiesel who received a Nobel Prize. It should also be noted that many people consider these prizes to be sort of political payoffs for jobs well done. Now, furthermore, and in the same vein, please consider it's almost as if some symbiotic relationship now exists between the Jews and the Germans. We can never break loose from them. We're, Jews are, doomed to go through the ages together, tied to them, the Germans, by our Jewish hatred. This is a um, citation from God's Covenant People, chapter 6, page 139, Citing James Yaffe, uh, 1968, The American Jew, uh, page 58. Well, uh, bearing this in mind, uh, uh, it might be well to consider the following uh, citation. <clears throat> we, Jews, regard our race as superior to humanity and look forward not to its ultimate union with other races, but to its triumph over them. This is a citation from God's Covenant People, chapter 6, uh, page 130, citing Professor Goldwyn Smith, uh, quoted by Colonel Jack Moore in From the Horse's Mouth. Uh, incidentally, Goldwyn Smith was professor of modern history at England's Oxford University in 1881. He later taught history at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. For supposition, what of this animosity um, was more general uh, and actually was aimed at the Celto-Germanic people uh, and uh, Christianity, uh, per se. The Jewish people as a whole will be its own Messiah. It, the Jews, will attain world dominion by the dissolution of other races, by the abolition of frontiers, the annihilation of monarchy, and by the establishment of a world republic in which the Jews will everywhere exercise the privilege of citizenship. In this new world order, the children of Israel, the Jews misnamed, will furnish all the leaders without encountering opposition. The governments of the different peoples forming the world republic will fall without difficulty into the hands of the Jews. It will then be possible for the Jewish rulers to abolish private property and everywhere to make use of the resources of the state. Thus will the promise of the Talmud be fulfilled in which is said that when the messianic time is come, the Jews will have all the property of the whole world in their hands. This is a citation from God's Covenant People, chapter 6, page 129, citing Baruch Levy's letter written to Heinrich Karl Marx, quoted in La Revue de Paris, 1 June 1928, page 574. I believe that the strange uh, uh, emergence of the Holocaust uh, uh, as the uh, salient aspect of uh, the belligerent event known as World War II uh, has a certain inverse relationship uh, to the prominence of Christianity uh, in uh, Western society. I, I see in this sort of uh, an indication of the demise of Christianity uh, uh, in any kind of um, real sense. I, of course, exclude bogus Christian thought uh, entirely. But um, uh, nevertheless, uh, please consider uh, this particular citation. Fundamentally, Judah is anti-Christian. God's covenant people, 
chapter 8, page 189, citing the London Jewish World, 1923. Now, it should be noted that of the three most prominent countries uh, doing Christian missionary work in the world, uh, we find Germany as one, uh, the other two being England and the United States of America. Well, uh, bearing this in mind, uh, uh, it might be well to consider the following uh, citation. The Rothschild banking dynasty, history shows, had a long record of financing revolution. Another revolutionary backed by the Rothschilds was Alexander Herzen, who has ironically, in light of his non-Russian heritage, been called by establishment historians the father of Russian communism. This is a citation from the Barnes Review, volume four, number one, January, February, 1998, page 66, citing article by Michael J. Beaver, page 64. And as for the horrendous part of that phrase, um, well, uh, this applies to events um, uh, of a smaller, lesser nature than uh, large armies uh, pitted against one another in field battle. Um, also, uh, it might be said that if the um, German soldiers acted in a generally professional and correct way, how do they get this horrible label uh, of being uh, very wicked, uh, bestial kinds of uh, people and so forth? Could it be that they have been slandered? Well, uh, this is a possibility we'll explore a little bit, but um, I would like to bring up that it, it is not uncharacteristic of Jews to point the finger at others for committing nefarious deeds which they themselves have committed. Um, if we look at um, uh, the Holocaust in this context, uh, we may find that um, uh, it is merely a displacement and echo of bloody deeds uh, done in earlier times uh, in uh, around World War I uh, and up to World War II and beyond uh, and perpetrate, perpetrated by uh, Jews themselves. Is there evidence of this? Well, uh, consider the following. The Soviet Republic of Hungary was formed March 21, 1919. Leading the communist was the bloodthirsty 33rd degree Jewish Freemason, Bela Kuhn, it's Cohen. Kuhn was Grand Master of the Grand Orient Lodge, Halatus uh, at uh, Debrecen. Although political and economic conditions made his coup bloodless, it did not remain so. Grand Orient Freemasons began blaming the middle and upper classes for Hungary's problems, suggesting they be eliminated. Assisting Kuhn were the following Grand Orient Masons, Comrade Kunzi, Minister of Public Instructions, Comrade Yazi, National Minister of the Soviets, Comrade Agistan Peter, Comrade Lukas, Comrade Diener Zoltan, Comrade Alexander Garbe, that's Joseph Pagoni, Head of the Army, Comrade Rone, Minister of Justice, Comrade Varga Weichselbaum for Finance, Comrade Vince Weinstein as governor of the capital, Comrade Moritz Erdely, and Comrade Zizo Biro for the police, and the bloodthirsty Comrade Tibor Samueli, Prime Minister. Samueli engineered the slaughter of the bourgeoisie while traveling about Hungary in a special train, an eyewitness of which there were few, uh, gives the following account. This train of death rumbled through the Hungarian night, and where it stopped, men hung from trees, and blood flowed in the streets. Along the railway line, 
one often found naked and mutilated corpses. Samuel a passed sentence of death in the train, and those forced to enter it never related what they had seen. Samuel lived in it constantly. Thirty Chinese terrorist triads watched over his safety. Special executioners accompanied him. The train was composed of two saloon cars, two first-class cars reserved for the terrorists, and two third-class cars reserved for the victims. In the latter, the executions took place. The floors were stained with blood. The corpses were thrown from the windows while Samueli sat at his dainty little writing table in the saloon car upholstered in pink silk and ornamented with mirrors. A single gesture of his hand dealt out life or death. Within weeks, Bella Kuhn and his Masonic comrades had destroyed the old order. Three months after forming the Soviet Republic of Hungary, Bella Kuhn and his comrades fled to Russia, where they continued their slaughter under Lenin and Trotsky. Uh, this is a citation from Scarlet and the Beast uh, by uh, John Daniel, um, uh, Volume 1, uh, pages uh, 469 and 70. After this, what is left but Germany? Uh <laughs>